what's the topic of the panel before we introduce the panelists? It's a panel discussion. What's the topic for the panel? Predictability and predictability, predictability and productivity. Does Agile help? So we have four people who are extremely qualified to be on this panel, and notice there's one chair that's left open, which means that any one of you is equally qualified to come up here, and if you want to contribute, come and chill in, and then you can go back, so we can leave that chair empty for someone else. So kind of mixing a little bit of fishbowl style of a panel, where we want to involve you guys to come up as well, but we have these guys whose seats are glued and they can't move. But uh, there's one seat open for anyone to come in, give your answers, and then go back. So that gives opportunity for someone else. Let me quickly introduce our panel and we'll get started. So you heard Joshua in the morning. So thanks, Josh, for joining the panel. Linda is the keynote speaker. You'll hear her tomorrow. She also did a retrospective workshop today. So thanks, Linda. We have Gaurav here. Uh, I think Gaurav is someone you might have not met during the conference. He just came for the panel. Uh, let me give a quick introduction about Gaurav. I met Gaurav about three weeks ago. Two weeks ago, I always mix up time. Uh, Gaurav is a co-founder of a company called Saba. Uh, he is also the main champion, or one of the main champions here, who is helping the Pune uh, startup ecosystem doing a lot of work, uh, bringing all the different organizations which help the startup. Uh, so when I first uh, sent him an email, he replied back, we got on the phone, and uh, wow, I mean, he was extremely encouraging. So I can see how he's been supporting all the startup, the entire Pune ecosystem here. So thanks for joining us, Gaurav Mehra. And Julian, you just heard Julian give his keynote about how he's changing the world with uh, his school, his experiments about education. Uh, so we have these four panelists. I'm going to kick off the panel with one question uh, because I chose the topic, right? So I'm going to kick off the panel with one question. You guys have one mic, so one person gets a chance and then everyone could chip in. And once I'm done with the question, they've answered it, then I'll pass this mic around and whoever has a question can ask a question, all right? Clear so far? Yep. Oh, fantastic. <coughs> Miracles. So, the, the reason we put this uh, topic together was, you know, often when we talk to a lot of companies, they say, oh, yes, we want to go agile. And you say, that's fantastic, but what are your expectations? What do you want out of agile? Why are you making this transition? Guess what's the answer? We want to be faster. Faster, better productivity. Everyone is doing it. Yes? Predictability is another common thing. We want our software delivery to be more predictable. We want it to be more uh, higher quality. All of these things people talk about. But the things that most people struggle with, in my opinion, I could be wrong, is predictability and productivity. Uh, the reason is because I believe there are a lot of misconceptions around that and we thought it would be good to get a panel and have a discussion around that. Uh, so that's the idea behind the panel. So can each of you define in your own terms what, what do we mean by, or what do you mean by productivity and what do you mean by predictability? What, what does these terms mean to you? I was working for a medium-sized telecom company when I started doing Agile, and we had a struggle with a particular customer who came in one day and said, I don't know what I want, but I want it by June. <laughs> and of course, this is a company in the U.S., so what did we say? Yeah. Yeah, we can do that. Now, we knew that if we were going to follow our regular process, that would be impossible because the regular process involved a requirements document, spending a fair amount of time up front really understanding what the customer wanted, 
before we ever began any sort of move toward development. So that's when we discovered Scrum. This was in the mid-90s. And we realized that this would help us because we could begin with the knowledge of what we could start with, a little tiny piece of that. And that by the time we delivered that little piece, well then the customer would know a little bit, the market would know a little bit, and we could add on to that first little piece, and that's how we proceeded. It wasn't that the customer was trying to be difficult. The customer really didn't know. And in fact, no one knew. That deadline was not artificial. The customer knew that the market was about to change and that things were going to happen in June and that they were going to stay in the game. They would have to be ready for that. So the end of the story is we were able to deliver. And I will never forget that retrospective. It said, we grew this together. So if we want to talk about increase in productivity, there's no way we could have done that using our old process. And that's what Agile brings to the table. It's not a comparison, old against new or more productive or not. It's that we're able to do things we would not have been able to do before in a way that we didn't really understand about how to interact with customers before. It's a whole new way of working. So I answered the question by not answering the question. Did you notice that?
So, uh, enough for me. Um, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to assume they said everything that needed to be said about predictability and productivity. Uh, can I get a quick census in the room since I haven't been here all morning? How many of you are working in cloud software? Delivering software in the cloud? Is everybody else good old enterprise behind the firewall on premise stuff? On premise, what about the hands? And how many are doing services, software services? Okay, so interesting mix. Uh, I think uh, I'll, I'll take my personal perspective. You know, we, we started our company in good old Clamsville, moved over to Java, J2E, and started delivering over the web years ago, and finally transformed to being a true multi tenant cloud application. And it's been quite a journey. But uh, I think this, the whole conversation of uh, agile delivery, when I look at delivering software in the cloud, it's very straightforward. You have to do it. It's the only way to do it. Uh, we move from one major release a year to monthly packs and a full quarterly release, um, delivered to all of my customers immediately uh, around the globe. Uh, can't do it if you're not agile. Uh, certainly can't do the kind of release planning we did in the past. Um, and we've gone as far as completely changing our whole enterprise rollout process because uh, you can't do it the same way anymore. So the classic ERP rollout of go we'll gather big requirements and go we'll take it through uh, six months, nine months, 12 months rollouts, you just can't do it anymore. Um, and because those who built in the days that went with the enterprise software, you purchased your stuff, you put the stuff up, you roll out the software, and then you came back three years later for the big upgrade, doesn't happen that way anymore. Features keep arriving every, every quarter. Um, new stuff's available in the software. How do you get it adopted? How do you get it rolled out? How do people take it on? Um, how do you get them that stuff? How do you make them use that stuff? How do they get value out of that stuff so they'll renew later? The business is completely different. It's real time. The stuff's happening continuously. Uh, you're responding continuously. You can't do it the old way. It's over and done with. Uh, so I don't know uh, any other way to do it at this point. Uh, so I think it goes back to the essence. It's about being able to do things in increments, recognize that th you want to respond very rapidly because the market and your competition is performing at that same rate. Uh, and uh, really, the, you really don't know what you need now, next quarter, what are you going to need to compete when somebody buys somebody, integrates somewhere else and sells somewhere else. Okay, thank you. So for a chief, before we turn back to people for asking questions, Alright, uh, what I wanted to do is ask you uh, to share a favorite story about uh, you know, something to do with estimation, something to do with predictability, something to do with productivity. One of your favorite stories where you feel like, oh my god, this has just gone crazy. Sprint. He didn't really know what Scrum was, but sort of used this language. 
And uh, they started, the velocity started really increasing a lot, all of a sudden, after lots of consistency. And we were working with other teams at this point, so we weren't really working with them. But we, you know, we thought that they were very mature. We really assumed this was one of the most mature teams we've ever worked with. Um, in fact, uh, well, whatever. So I come over and I see that their velocity is like up in the 80s. But they haven't gotten any new people, but nothing's really changed. And so I said to this one uh, woman, I said, you know, hey, how did you go from the 50s just a few months ago up to the 80s? And she said, well, Josh, these days, uh, when you sneeze, you get a story point. Uh, so this was one of the early sort of cracks in the armor for us of what story points are. And it, just, it was just ridiculous. I mean, it was uh, total point inflation just to sort of show the manager that they're going faster. But really nothing had changed at all. That's a good story. <laughs> Anyone else have any story to share? So I was running around. I, I didn't really have a question. So the question is that do you have any uh, any story about uh, estimation, about predictability, about productivity, where people did something, you know, and you were like, oh my God, what have, what have they done? And that was the difference for us. 
our, our rollouts are most successful because the customer can see exactly everything coming along as opposed to trying to get all these big project meetings to try to assess where the hell they were. Um, the rollouts are predictable. Everybody knows what's happening. Uh, it's simple, it's obvious, the software's coming together and rising up in front of them. It just makes a massive difference. So I was uh, working with a team that wrote um, tools for compilers and debuggers in embedded systems. And every time the uh, project manager came in, the uh, team would say, well, we've done this before for a particular environment, and we know exactly how long it took us for that one, so we should be able to estimate this one. It should really be the same. We're really doing the same thing over and over again. It's just a different environment. And what they found over time was that their estimates were always wrong. Even though they had done it before, that they were not repeatable. And that's what they thought they should do, would be repeatable. So when we switched to Scrum, we started being more agile. I don't know what the difference was. I don't know what the magic dust was. But somehow, not only were they able to deliver faster, and they could measure that because they had done the same thing before, but they were surprised themselves at how much easier it was not spending all that time up front. And so for that team, it was a great sales um, departure for me to continue to work with the rest of the organization because this particular team had such a bad history of estimation. So I don't know exactly how to explain that, but it worked. All right, so we'll open the floor for questions. Anyone has questions to the panel? If not, I can continue asking questions. <coughs> Going once. It, it doesn't have to be productivity or predictability specific. If you have other questions for the panel, feel free. Now look, you had two days with me yesterday, and all you did all day was ask questions, so I know you can do it. Come on. So, um, with regards to uh, adapting, uh, adaptability, so. generally with uh, Indian firms, uh, we tend to adopt to the methodology or uh, you know, the kind of work we do uh, is mostly comes from the client. What kind of culture or what kind of work does the client want, wants us to do? And we'll do it. Now, that's one of the reasons, I mean, I'm not seeing a lot of innovation or uh, something new coming out uh, in Agile or otherwise as well uh, from the Indian companies. Now, do you really think that there's a difference when uh, the adaptability of Agile goes? in the West and in the East, and how, how does it culturally uh, differ? Is that question clear, or you want me to elaborate on that? No, I know exactly what you're talking about. You're, you're, you're saying uh, here in India, uh, let me just make sure I understand, because I think I do. It's that here in India, you're going to do what the customer wants in whatever, North America or Europe or, or something like that, and play you know, that style of game. Um, even if it's right or wrong, even if, it's, if you don't think it's what they, what they need, right? Uh, is that correct? Yeah. So um, I've had people that have worked for me, coaches that have worked for me, who have actually flown here. They're, some of them were Indian. Uh, they've flown to India, worked with teams to teach them how to push back, how to say no, how to work towards a better solution rather than just doing what they're told. Because um, it's not something I think that, you know, is, is expected. And, and so you just want to be, you want to please the customer, so you do what they say instead of trying to really help the customer figure out what they really need. And um, to me, that, that's a better way to work. I mean, ultimately, you're, you're trying to help your customer. So just, a lot of times, you know, as Linda said, the customer doesn't know what they want. The customer doesn't really know what they need, so they'll say something, and if you just listen to it, you could be wrong. You're trying to explore the space 
with them and figure out what they really need. So I think that there's a great opportunity here to change the way uh, you interact with these, co these companies in North America and Europe to be um, even more valuable by, by really engaging with them to, to discover you know, the really important things that need to get done rather than just what they ask for. Um, since I go to uh, conferences and I uh, talk to people in companies all over the world, there is a difference. There's a difference between the way Agile is done in the U.S. and the way Agile is done in, I'm not going to use India as an example, I'm going to use Eastern Europe. So Eastern Europe is the target of a lot of outsourcing efforts as well. And in Eastern Europe, there's also an attitude of acceptance that we do what we're told. If the customer wants X, we deliver X. But what I've seen over time is that that's how we all begin. The beginning stages of Agile are sort of a following of the process. We know what the steps are. We go through the motions. And that if we've gotten a hold of the real message of Agile, then we learn over time. I talked today about retrospectives and what I think the real purpose should be is experiments and that that should extend into your own lives. You should always be trying something new. And I think that if there's a real deep understanding of what Agile is all about, then you may begin by doing what somebody else tells you what to do, but that over time, you're going to get better. And I have seen that happen. I have seen changes in teams that I work with, and I've seen them learn, and I've seen them grow. And I've seen them get to the point where all of a sudden now they're demanding more input, more learning. They want their voices to be heard. And I see that everywhere, in India as well as Eastern Europe. After that, uh, it's, a, it's an evening time, so uh, and unfortunately I'm going to leave you for a long time. So, uh, how many of you? from multinationals? Okay, uh, that's the problem. I take that question and say it's ridiculous uh, because we just had a conversation that's about 10 years old. Uh, but I started down the street, they're top of the line, uh, a group that every day the technology you can, built in the cloud, uh, they're growing at massive speed their agile from the ground, it wasn't even a conversation. Uh, the problem is we're sitting in multinational back offices where we, forgot, you know, we don't really do some innovation. We just can't get to any of what we do. Then somebody sends somebody else to train us and say, well, let's go do that. Then we spend days in conferences talking about how we can do agile. Outside on the street, uh, this is one of the hottest places in India for startups. None of them are having this conversation. They're already agile, they're lean, they're moving at high speed, they're contributing to GitHub, they're building software that's going on at very rapid pace. There's a few right there. Um, I don't understand that question anymore. Let's ask in the context of all those guys sitting in the big multinational, with those comfortable confines of the big software services operations. Yeah, you're having trouble. You're also the same guys having conversations about how innovation will happen. It's happening around you. Wake up, a lot of you guys are quitting and doing it anyway. Um, I'll add to that encouragement, which is ultimately you're responsible for your own careers. And you probably know this. And sometimes it can be really hard work to do something at work. But there are little things like code retreats, which happened at actually the International Code Retreat Day which last weekend, I think on Saturday. And you can go there for a day, you can hack, you can pair, you can talk about programming, do programming. And your company doesn't even need to know about it. Uh, if that's a big deal, don't tell them. On the other hand, you go back with new skills, new perspectives, and if you can't convince people at work that this might help them better by doing a little bit of it, not doing little micro experiments at work, if you've got a three week project, spend a day on it, see if you can do something that's useful and show people by example, then really it's time to move. And then maybe it's time for somebody to move on from the multinationals, and I work with them as well. But I certainly wasn't treated as a back end, you know, what's other what to do. Um, it was much more an egalitarian relationship, and that's what you need to have. And I'd certainly like to see much more of that and have you been to the industry. If I could just respond to that. Uh, I think
slightly uh, add a different perspective to this based on my experience. Uh, if you look at the Indian software industry, I, I can, we can broadly classify into four types of companies. Uh, we have the startups, uh, very small percentage but rapidly growing, right? And I'm sure no one would debate that no innovation is happening over there because I think there's a hell lot of innovation happening there. Some of them more, some of them less. Uh, then we have the product companies which could be either, you know, like the Googles of the world with having offices over here or homegrown product companies right? like the direct eyes of the world or the you know Sabas of the world or any of those which are homegrown product companies right and then we have two other things which is what we think the software industry is all about is the captives which is large gigantic companies having back back office centers over here and then the services companies which basically are you know we do whatever you guys want right so if you look at, and, and there was a bunch of uh, research done around, not research, but uh, surveys done around how many of these last two categories of companies are actually doing agile? Pretty much everybody, right? Is it any good? You and I would say, oh, that's horrible because these guys are, you know, manipulating this whole thing. They don't even understand what agile is. This is manipulating the whole thing, doing whatever bullshit they're doing and calling it agile. And I was of the opinion until I paid, I visited a bunch of them and I started seeing from their perspective, right? You have to understand how their business models work, right? They can't just be agile because, and, and basically fire all the people. Uh, you know, their business models operate quite differently. The more bo bodies you can throw on the project, the more money they make, right? Is that necessarily bad? I don't know, right? Maybe I would disagree that that's a bad, I would, I would say it's a bad way to do, but they have put us on the roadmap of the software, you know, highway in the world, right? I mean, companies come to India because they see the big giant companies building software. And the thing surprising to me was what I thought of good services companies, small niche boutique shops, they don't have repeating customers. While these large gigantic companies have repeating customers, they must be doing something right. They must be innovating in some way for them to having continuous business. It, it can't just be all crap and you know, still do, making a lot of money. So I think innovation is happening in a lot of interesting ways. We call it Jugaad. Right? There's a lot of jugaad happening 
I think they're doing very interesting stuff. They're taking Agile, they're mishmashing it with whatever they want, and they're coming up with their own new flavors of things. Uh, I think that's innovation. Innovation at a process level. They're finding ways to make it work for them, given their business model and constraints. So I, I think that's, that's what I think of it. Yes, yeah, sorry. You, you have a question or you want to add into this? I want to ask. A question? Yeah. yeah. We, have, we have here a person with a question and then we come to you. Yeah, so my question is uh, very much related to uh, the same topic, uh, but slightly different twist. When you work with an Indian client as a services company, then a lot of times, I mean, India is a you know, big client base, growing client base, so, uh, but what happens is that the customer is not as well educated as you would uh, encounter when you are uh, dealing with a uh, US based or UK based customer. So uh, invariably what happens is that the first talk is how much is going to cost. We are also a very cost conscious market. And you expect to give a fixed bid quote, right? So given the requirements, whether they are uh, very clearly defined or they are not very clearly defined, they would say, okay, just look at this particular site and I want to build something like this, how much do you think it is going to cost? <coughs> so the first thing comes to the cost, the fixed rate model. And then you are supposed to, uh, when the project starts, that's when you are supposed to build it. So from the customer side, he's probably talking to five, 10 different vendors, asking them the cost, and then going with, the, with one that they feel most comfortable with, and with the less cost. So uh, as a services company, you are, I mean, once the project starts and now you go to uh, you you have, uh, you know, you're always torn between uh, wanting to do a superb job versus uh, the bid being fixed, you uh, may not have a lot of leeway. So how would you get on to that? Because this hits the predictability that, that we are talking about. So fixed bid versus agile. Is, is basically the uh, I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive at all. Uh, I think uh, we all sell in India. Uh, I, we sell abroad. We sell in India. So I don't think. By the way, I think that Indian customers are not unsophisticated at all. We actually put them up with American and Australian customers. In at least my market and the exposure we see. Uh, but we're cost-conscious people. Let's face it. Yeah. So we, we ask price up front and then we then we go from there. Uh, but look, if you and I have a fixed bid. What are we really managing at that point? We're managing risk to ourselves of exceeding that number. And I can approach that problem two ways. I can try to get all these requirements, sit down, and then try to build it and discover it. Really know what you want it, as we have. Or I build it in increments and try to engage it to the maximum degree possible to try to converge to an outcome sooner. Why would I go out of I'd want to do things in increments and say, you like this? Okay, let's go to the next bit. Do you like this? Do you go to the next bit? As opposed to go bid for three months and then have it blow up in my face. It's about if it's about risk mitigation, that's the best way to do it. Yeah. Okay. We'll go there. Are you happy with the answer? <laughs> okay. Question to the panel. In a manufacturing world, it's very easy to measure the productivity because of the repeatability and all so many things. In, in, in the agile world, in the software world, how do you measure the productivity and what kind of challenges you see? Or do you would like to throw some light on that? Manufacturing versus software. Okay. Manufacturing would be straightforward. Software is not that straightforward. How do you deal with that? So in manufacturing, because you have tangible products that you're building, and it's essentially you know, some kind of an assembly line, so you could measure the productivity by number of units generated per time, and that would be a measure of productivity. But in software, and especially agile, how do you measure productivity? Well, I'd say it's it's uh, you know it's a much more it's a much different game 
right? You could you could think that you have fantastic uh, productivity, but you have horrible knowledge silos. And if one of those persons leaves your company, your productivity is going to fall away completely, right? So it, it's very uh, you know difficult. You have to look at a bunch of different dimensions. Uh, we need to look at you know do you have really high quality requirements coming in so you know that what you're building is actually going to be needed. Do you have uh, competent people building it? Are they trained to be building good software, high quality software? Are you looking at the quality all the time and seeing that yes, indeed, we're building high quality? Because if we're not, productivity is going to go down. Uh, our, our, and we look at test code, for example, an automated test to make us go faster. That's the safety net. Without it, we go slower, afraid to change code. So you're looking at that. Uh, many different dimensions. This is the silos, like I said, risk management around that. Um, are you uh, working in these small batches, right? Uh, you know, as this gentleman said here, right? Working in small batches, you're actually producing tangible things that work versus taking all the risk of hoping it all fits together. Even in, even in the hardware space, we've seen, you know, places where the mechanical engineer and the, and the electrical engineer are supposed to integrate, they don't integrate early, and then they find there's a problem. Um, so early integrations continuously happening. One of the biggest problems I find around around productivity is the teams aren't even organized for success from the very beginning. They aren't cross-functional teams. They don't work well together. They don't even work together. You, I was just talking to a gentleman uh, before this. He said, you know, we have our, our mainframe programmers, and then we have our Java programmers. They're each good, but when they have to integrate, it's a mess. I was like, well, why don't you actually get them in the same room, working together every single day, building little embryonic things that they evolve? That's going to be continuous integration. So are you doing something like that? The bottom line is you have to look at all of the various risks in software development and take them head on. This is what Extreme Programming did, and this is what something like Lean Startup does. These things, they look at the risks and they really manage those risks. That leads to higher productivity. So when I first started talking about agile development, a manager said, Linda, if we do agile development, will we be better? And I said, well, how good are you now? <laughs> On a scale of one to 10, are you a five? Are you a seven? Are you a 10? And he didn't know, because he had no way of measuring where he was, let alone he was really looking for some serious answers for me, let alone what I was going to be able to bring to the table if we started introducing some agile process. So I have a PhD in computer science, and if you kind of shake out exactly what my research was all about, it had to do with metrics. I was measuring design quality, but in order to do that, I had to do a lot of research around metrics and how they've been used in software and what if you do that research, what you'll find is horrifying because we do a terrible job of measuring just about anything in software. In fact, that's my talk tomorrow, is how poor we are at doing anything scientific. That is, looking at a measurable result for anything. We make our decisions based on a lot of stories gossip. We have no idea what we're doing. Um, I'll give you a couple of little um, comments. Uh, one is to look at productivity in terms of latency. So if someone wants something, how soon you will satisfy that need, whatever that is, and sometimes it's software. So that might be a very pragmatic way of measuring it, whether it's physical or software. And I just had a house bill still, what was it, nine months on, ten months on, some bits aren't finished, and some bits have just gone wrong. So how do I measure the builder's productivity, and how it's going to be, how long before it fixes the thing 
and even a couple of rough measurements will probably give you a lot more information than you otherwise have. And that's sometimes the most valuable measurement you'll ever get from going from no clue to some clue. And it looks at 90% confidence margins. So I'm 90% confident that it's between these two bounds. So measuring productivity, I have no clue how to measure it now. Could I say with some level of it's at least this and at most that. And once we get to that point, we can then decide whether we need to refine that or not. Or when we got closer to the answer, to say, okay, we'll move on from that. Thank you. What, one of the, I'll just step in here. One of my biggest concerns with the word productivity is I think we've taken it out of the context in many cases, right? So we look at you, know, you were talking about hardware or, or things like that or anything that's manufacturing centric. So we say, okay, number of units produced per time and that's productivity. But notice that the units produced are exactly the same. That's a problem we solved 30, 40 years ago. We have superb productivity. If you talk about compiling code and deploying it, it happens within minutes or sometimes within seconds. So that's a solved problem for us, right? The rest of it is a design process. So we have to go back and look at how long they take to design cars. Is that predictable? Is How do they measure things like that? Or how long do they take to design a new chip? Today we, today we can do on Wi-Fi, let's say, you know, 100 Mbps. Can we go from there to one gigabyte? And how long will that design process take? We don't measure that in terms of productivity. We measure that when we talk about assembly line. And I think we've kind of fitting a wrong uh, measurement or a wrong thought process into something that it doesn't fit, right? The other thing is, I think we can all agree here that measuring output is wasteful, but we should be focusing on outcomes, right? So you could be producing a lot of software. How does it matter? What's the outcome that, that you're able to get out of it? For all I care, I could produce a one little thing and that could have a massive outcome, right? Am I more productive? I think so, right? And so sometimes we need to go back and educate people in terms of how to think about this thing. So stop focusing on output, start focusing on outcomes. And I think we would have a more, a better discussion to have at that point. Okay. I think there were two, three people had a question. So I'll go there, she's been waiting and then I'll come to you, sorry. She has a long list, wow. Uh, in Agile, we always talk about teams collaboration, teams growth, teams success. Uh, in my practical experience, uh, in an average team of five or six, I have two, uh, let's say, champions or masters, and the other is I have average performance. Is that a good or a bad thing in it for Agile teams? So I'll just rephrase her question. So she's saying uh, she is a team in which two people are champions, are really good, and then the rest of them are average performers. Is that combination a good thing for Agile? Because there's a lot of misconceptions yeah. that you need a team of all champions to be Agile. It also touches on the, upon the evaluation phrases of Agile teams. <laughs>
group in San Diego that does mob programming. They're mob programming. Every day, all five or six of them work together in front of a projector, switching every 15 minutes who is at the keyboard and mouse. Okay? Do they have any mediocre players? Right? Uh, no, everyone really comes up together and they are enormously productive. Mm -hmm. Right? Unbelievably productive. This is back to those experiments, right? Y'all should maybe experiment for some time doing Bob program with that team and see what happens, right? Because you really are going to be better served if you can bring those people up with training, with collaboration, and, 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 and if it comes down to it, you know, what are the rewards there? If, if there's a reward system in place for bringing those people up, then, you know, that's, that's wonderful. It, it's a, it can be solved as well. So I give a talk about the Agile Mindset, which basically says that we hold either one of two mindsets about how people are. Whether you can label somebody and say that they have this set of attributes and they were born with it and that's all you can do about it. The Agile Mindset, on the other hand, believes that, well, of course, we all have limitations. No matter how hard I work, I'm never going to be Einstein. I know that there's probably a ceiling on my accomplishments, but I know that however good I am today, I believe that if I work hard and I try some experiments, I'm going to be better tomorrow. So I think that we should not go around labeling people, say who's mediocre and who isn't that we want to believe that everybody could be better tomorrow than they are today if we believe that they can because there are studies that show what you believe about the potential of the people that you work with creates an expectation that they strive to meet. So if we believe they can't do it, then that's the kind of performance that we get. If we believe that they are able to grow and that they're able to learn, then they do that. So I think if we adopt the Agile Mindset, not only for others, but for ourselves, that that's the best way to serve our teams. And I don't think there's any magic formula for how many experts or how many novices. As long as everybody's learning and that we all treat each other as though we can all learn, that's going to get us the best performance. I'll go through two different paths. Uh, Sal Khan, the guy who's at the Khan Academy, has a nice little three minute video on YouTube. And one of the questions he points out is there was a time when Einstein couldn't count to 10. Now you could just say, well, he's gone. Get rid of him. <coughs> it was quite young at the time, maybe. But nonetheless, you know, look what happened with him. The second is that when I code, I code really badly. I have a degree in computer science and all the other good stuff. And Google, I've written code at Google, it's in the main code base. But none of us who sat me down today for the programming exam and asked me to write in whatever the language is that I claim that they could write in, I would probably fail your tests. And I'll name two people. One is Simon Stewart and one is Devin Allison, both happen to work with me at Google. And both of them, when I code with them, make me feel I can do it. And they just remind me a little bit and ask a couple of questions. And guess what? The code I write is significantly better than it was 10 minutes ago because they have a nice way of nurturing that. So perhaps the challenge is not to look at the average, whatever the heck that means, um, but to say, how can we nurture these skills? And maybe you're the average, I'll be kind to you, um, and say, maybe you're the average, and maybe there's ways you'll find the nurturing and the encouragement, and that's what I think we need to look for. So kind of back to your and strengths. Encouragement, so. I'll again chip in here quickly. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not on the panel, but chipping in all the time. Uh, one of the things I notice is it's reality that you will not get a team of all A players, right? Let's just accept that. Uh, in fact, I would say that it's better that way because if you had a team of all A players, you probably would be stuck with a lot of egos rubbing their, you know, you would be stuck with a lot of people arguing, a lot of thinkers, very few doers, right? So that, that is also a problem in, in many sense. So having this diversity, let's, let's rephrase this, let's put a positive spin on it. Let's say it's diversity, right? One way of diversity is some people are, you know, pretty skilled, some people have more 
to do. And so you have these mix of things. Uh, back to what the panel was talking about is now when you have this diverse group, how can you engage them with each other so they can help each other to all improve, all get better. Someone might be good at something, someone might be good at something else. Can we find that social bonding where they can help each other? And I think that's quite possible. We've done that in a lot of places. Uh, decouple that from appraisals to start with because if appraisals is what is on the mind all the time, then it drives bad behavior. I mean, there's Daniel Pink's studies which talk about how when you, you know, motivate people by giving them financial rewards, it actually reduces their performance. It, it makes them behave badly, right? It makes them do bad things. So in, in my opinion, cherish the diversity, decouple the, uh, you know, appraisals for it, and if possible, let people decide uh, how they want to do like a 360 degree review or other kinds of things in terms of how they're going to reward. But what's important is to, to talk about these things openly. So I, I've seen that help uh, a lot of companies and that's, that's what I believe. We'll go over there. That gentleman is waiting for a long time. Can you please pass the mic over to him? And then there's one person in the back waiting, so we'll come to that person there. Okay, we'll come there. Yes. As it's agile, so suppose you have two champs in a team and four are average. So better to just pair these guys with the champs. So fortunately, the six champs will be there in the future. So in future, suppose two champs leaves the company. Anyway, she will have four champs in her team. Right? So pairing will help in that way. If not work, then only we have to go to the next step. Right? Whichever you have said. I, I wish uh, pairing did all the magic. <laughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't, right? Because, uh, you know, so what I'm trying to get at is, yes, pairing is good. I'm not disagreeing, but I don't think it will turn everyone into champs. Not right? everyone you have to right? look at multiple strategies in terms of how you will convert people. But, you know, sometimes letting the champs pair also is important. So, you know, uh, there's, there's, good amount of research done in terms of how you want to pair people up and it's not necessary that you always pair a champ with a mediocre programmer or an average programmer. You just let them self-select and it's good that way because they are going to build that and that's going to be more anti-fragile if I can use that term rather than trying to have this, you know, very dictated style of how people will pair. But, but pairing will certainly help, no debate on that. But usually the team should be like this only, right? And that's going to be the state forever, in my opinion. Let's just accept that. You will not have all champs one day. All right, back to the gentleman for the question. Uh, I have a small concern over uh, the major velocity of a team, especially in Scrum. Um, I mean, in one of your discussions, Narek was told, uh, like, I mean, you, you don't follow the ritual; you actually try to adapt it, right? So, what I I mean, based on experience, what I've seen is, I mean, calculate the velocity over the past uh, sprints. I mean, it's not, it doesn't work out actually, because every time you get new new stuff to deliver, which, though it sounds same, it's actually not same, right? Because there are few elements which are always new. So my question is like, I mean, in terms of measuring productivity, right? And how especially we use velocity for in, in terms of really scanning, we size up just, I mean, the epic stories or stories. Uh, that's about a month release. And then we divide that into iterations. So my question is uh, like now, theoretically we do use velocity, team velocity or whatever we have done in the past, but actually it doesn't measure up. So what happens is like in case of iteration, uh, we give the freedom and the team has a freedom like, okay, if this is not done, we split up or we put it in the next iteration. But what has happened, generally what happens is the product owner, uh, based on what we have done in the release planning, committed to the customer, right, and we have to end, do a release at the end of the day. So that's a conflict actually, because in iteration, during iteration, we do the stuff uh, using Agile, but at the end of the day, it's like we are committed to a certain set of stories, which we <coughs> may not be able to do in the span. So there's a conflict, and that's what I uh, want to know. Do you guys want me to repeat the question? Let me try and run my compression algorithm and see if I can bring it down. 
Right, so if I were to summarize, one of the things he's talking about is that when you do release planning, you, you, you plan the whole chunk and you say, you know, this is what we commit. And then when you start doing your iteration, you look at your velocity and things spill over. Or actually, you do your release planning based on your velocity. So you said, based on my velocity, I can do in six months 400 nuts, <laughs> right? And then when you get to your iterations, you say, well, it's self-organizing, all of that stuff, so things can spill over. And then you've committed to 400 nuts, but you don't end up delivering. So how do you deal with that problem? Is that yeah. fair? Yeah, okay. Okay, compression algorithm. I'm going to answer this one cheaply. You just sneeze a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I missed that, sorry. <laughs> I sneeze a lot. Oh, people should sneeze a lot, yes. <laughs> oh, well, velocity is killing agility, right? So if you Google that, uh, you will find a lot of stuff on that. Velocity is killing agility. Uh, it's, it's put us on a completely wrong path, in my opinion, that people are just going crazy over velocity and trying to get, you know, the numbers up. And as the as the panel here has talked about, uh, it's very easy to game that. It's, it's trivial to game that. I mean, kids, my five-year-old, six-year-old daughter can game that, right? Uh, it's just increase the estimates. So, Marish, so is it the fundamental problem in this question that you are committing something six months down? <laughs> is, so, uh, Sachin is asking, is it the fundamental problem that you've committed to something for a, a, a big chunk and then you're trying to execute it in this manner. Uh, Josh is ready. Uh, I don't, personally, I don't think it's fundamentally wrong because if you think from a business point of view, there are certain, you know, commitments you need to make. I mean, it's outside. But what is in your hand is the sophistication of the features, the sophistication of what you deliver and you can play around with that. No one's going to come and catch you. Obviously, you're not going to compromise on quality, but you can compromise on sophistication. That's a different way to look at it. Right. So if you're Sufficient supposed to design. deliver a car in six weeks or six months, whatever, whatever. If you do, I'm just using cars as an analogy, right? You're not going to work on heated leather seats in the first sprint or the second sprint. You're not going to work on the room roof. You're not going to work. What you're going to do, well, what, let me ask you, what are you going to do? What, what are you going to do if you want to deliver the car in this the time period? Look for another the job. The framework. <laughs> <laughs> huh? The framework. The framework. Uh, chassis. Engine chassis. Well, the chassis. Okay, but could, could you build me an embryonic car? A car that actually moves, but it's very primitive? Yes. Very primitive. Yes. But Wheel. it actually has wheels. Wheel. Maybe I can't turn exactly, but it, it has wheels. I can kind of go one direction. Uh, I can, I, you know what I'm saying? You, you have a tuk tuk. There we go. I have a tuk tuk. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're going to have to decide how to turn the tuk tuk into you know, a car. But the point is, you, the thing that I see all around the industry with respect to release planning is that companies adopting Agile are not doing evolutionary design. They're not building that embryonic thing first. It works, it's very primitive, and then evolving it. They're just failing to do that. So, I mean, you know, it's that, that's the problem. And it, you also can't commit to something and fix in stone what you're doing. That's called the Iron Triangle. Everyone know the, it's called water. The Iron Triangle is scope, schedule, and cost. If you fix all three, you are not agile. There's no way that you're possibly agile. What we need to do instead is to be able to, so what Jim Highsmith says, in fact, is scope, schedule, and cost is actually just one of the sides of the triangle. Right? The other side is value. Right? What value am I trying to deliver? I'm going to do so schedule of costs to sort of optimize on value. And then the other one is, of course, uh, just quality. Right? Because I can do all this, but if I don't have quality, then what do I have? Right? There's uh, the company that makes the airbags for cars. Right now, North America is a big problem because people are getting injured by the airbags. They're doing the opposite of what they're supposed to do. They have good productivity there? Uh, I don't think so, right? The quality's not there. So value, quality, and then the scope, schedule, cost is a more agile way of looking at it. So again, you have to do evolutionary design. You have to adjust the release plan. I call it iterative release plan. Every two weeks, go update what you say you're going to deliver at the end of some 
large period of time, whether it's three months, six months. And by the way, we like to do it. If I have a six month release, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to break it into two months, two months, two months. I'm going to have two internal releases of two months each, followed by the external release out of six months. And for the first two months, I'm going to build the embryonic thing. It's going to be tested, it's going to have good quality, and it's going to you know, be embryonic. And then I'm going to evolve that. And I'm going to evolve what I say I'm going to deliver in the full six months based upon my experience in those first two months. Right? That is uh, a way to sort of manage the risks a little bit better. And again, that has nothing to do with velocity. There's no velocity to be dealt with. Um, we don't use velocity. What we say is for every story, let the team tell you kind of how many weeks it's going to take. One week, two weeks. If it's three weeks, break it up, make it smaller. And that's, I, I write, I talk about that in my blog on Stop Using Story Books. You can read about it. If you get to the very bottom of it, it's a very long piece. So basically, the productivity is something which, um, I mean, we cannot concretely talk about productivity during this uh, initial phase, right? I mean, uh, I, I, I got the point. Uh, we need to basically make it more elaborative over a period, right? It needs to be the prototyping kind of thing. And that is possible when we have already a stable platform and we are building on top of that. But what if we are trying to do a greenfield green product or, you know, something out of scratch? So in that case, I mean, uh, it's really important. I mean, having a constant velocity, to me, is a smell. It, it tells you that people are gaming the system. If it's not fluctuating, then how are people so accurate in their estimates? I mean, it just beats me, right? I mean, that, that, whether it's a stable product, whether it's uh, some other product, I, I, it's hard to believe that you can actually have a stable velocity unless people are gaming it. Velocity is not a number. Can't add, subtract, multiply, and divide with it. It's an estimate. You got it by well. God knows how you got it. <laughs> God numbers. only knows how most of us come up with some of these things that we use in estimates, but they're not numbers. It look like a number. It's a two or a three or a forty-five or whatever it is, and we get carried away with that, and we think we can do operations like add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Those are estimates. Most of those are swags. And we should start using something else instead of a number so that we wouldn't get carried away with them and think they really mean something. They're conveyors of information that are no better than colors or t-shirt sizes, but they're not numbers. As soon as you have a number, somebody's going to start doing things that are inappropriate with it like add, subtract, multiply, and divide, you hand that off to your manager and he says, well, how about can we cut it in half? Or can we double? Or can we? That's totally inappropriate. And we've been doing that all along just because the figure or the symbol or the way we handle that thing looks like a digit of some kind, and it really is not. That's the first mistake. And that is certainly not agile, is to slap that integer on a quantifiable thing that's just not, it, it, it's meaningless. So, I mean, we should spend a little time on mathematics here. I was a mathematician before I came to uh, computer science. It's inappropriate use. It's like, we put, do you put numbers on the backs of your sports teams? I don't know, what's the sport in Indiana? Cricket. The people have numbers on the back, 45. Okay, so it would be like saying, what's the average on this team? Let's take all those numbers on the back of those. It's that kind of operation. It's meaningless. So stop doing that. It's just building on that. I think one of the reasons why people talk about Fibonacci series for, for story point estimate is so that you cannot apply arithmetics on top of it. I mean, the whole, it's a non-linear uh, you know, numbering system. So you don't apply arithmetics on it. But we just turn around and we say, okay, let's add all of these and take an average, and that's our velocity. Uh, you know, estimations considered harmful. If you search for that, you'll find a lot of people talking about how this is fundamentally flawed. Before, before asking my original question, I just have a follow-up on this. And I think uh, somehow 
when we are actually scaling Agile, this velocity concept gets tricky because as you're saying that, and I agree with this because it's a physical term velocity, if you want to be in acceleration, you have to increase in velocity. The point is, when you do a relative sizing, you still can burn more stories with the same point. So if you are actually calculating velocity by adding all your points, your velocity will be same, but you're burning more stories by doing a relative sizing. For example, if you wanted to actually paint two walls, to start with one wall, you'll do a size of three. But to again paint a second wall, you might actually size a wall with a size of one. But in the same time frame, you can actually paint three different balls, walls. So now you are actually painting four walls for the same story points. So I think when you, again, when you do calculation for velocity in terms of story points, that velocity will still be the same, but now you're burning more stories. So that's why, I mean, when we are actually, I mean, that's the term, when we are actually a scaling agile program level, this is the concept I read about relative sizing. When you do the relative sizing, you still can have the same velocity in terms of story points, but you can burn more stories. So what are your thoughts on this? That's way too complicated. Who said that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, uh, in the Saves framework itself, they're talking about relative sizing, and they're talking about uh, scaling agile at I mean, a scaling is at program level, but then they are talking about, you know, it's still, when, when we are doing this relative sizing, you're burning more stories. So if you want to actually calculate velocity in terms of burning stories, you are actually gaining your velocity. You're increasing your velocity in terms of burning more. But if you're actually calculating velocity in terms of adding those story points, you still have the same story points. Because now you have broken it down, and you're able to actually paint the ball quicker. So you're actually sizing by doing a relative thinking with whatever you've actually you know, painted first, at the first time. I still don't get it. <laughs> Guys, it's late on Friday evening. <laughs> they may ask simple English questions in a short sentence. Okay. We're going to ask you a question. Why don't you ask a question? Uh, my question was, uh, when Naresh said that velocity, and I agree with this, velocity has to grow if you want to actually, you know, grow, if you want to actually get acceleration out of it. But then this relative sizing, because I read it, that's how it actually confused me. The relative sizing, and here we are also talking about increasing the velocity. So you're back to the same question. <laughs> <laughs> Relativity. You know, the, 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 this, this whole thing of uh, velocity and having to accelerate, guys, it's a broken it's metaphor, I think. Yeah, it, it's a it, totally it's broken so, metaphor. This whole metaphor is broken. I mean, we're, we, we're, we're, as he said, we're starting to dig ourselves into story points and velocity and acceleration, when the issue is, how do we produce software more reliably, predictably, by breaking it up into smaller pieces that mean something and then we can test and say, put that away and then go on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. That's it. It's, it's nothing more complicated than that, right? The rest is just methodologies to help you. Agree. You I don't agree. have to get stuck in them. Yep, yep. I agree. I, I agree with that. I mean, it's just the follow-up because that's how it came to my mind. My original question was a little different. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I think we need to pass the mic. There are people waiting. My question was actually related to, I mean, age I itself. 30 years back, this was an infant. Waterfall was a young guy. How, where do you see age I 20 years from now? How do you see age 20 years from now? Uh, 10 years ago, did you say? 30 years ago. 30 years ago, it was an infant. Today, it's a, it's a grown up adult. While I think it's dead and buried, but <laughs> as our manifesto is 10 plus years old, the agile manifesto is just a little over 10 years old. It's 11 and a half or something like that. 
So there wasn't any, although if you look at the roots of every single element in Agile, whatever the flavor is, none of that is new. It's all been around. In fact, Craig Larman, uh, I think he was the only author, I'm trying to remember if there was a second author, wrote an article for either IEEE computer or IEEE software that took all of those elements, traced them back to some source decades earlier. So what's new about Agile is just the coalescing of all the ideas. None of them are new. The notion of let's do all these things together and call it something, that's new. But Agile itself began or was instigated by a bunch of old white guys who gathered in a ski resort and uh, said, hey, isn't there a better way? And uh, that, that, that's not that old. That was just a little over 10 years old. So you're asking what would it be like in 20 years? I think, it's, I hope it's gonna be gone. Absolutely. So I'm incredibly old and I've been in this business a long time and I've seen a lot of things come and go and I think Agile will be one of those. I can remember what the world was like before Agile. I'm sure I'll see what the world is like after Agile and something new, in fact, I'm gonna talk about that tomorrow, something new will come along. I don't know what it will be, so I can't, you know, Yogi Berra said, boy, it's really difficult to predict, especially things about the future. <laughs> I think uh, there is, okay, there it is. So I just had uh, one comment about this velocity measuring. I come from a manufacturing company, a very large one in the United States, um, and everybody is always asking this question, how do you measure velocity? Um, really, I think the question you should be asking yourselves is, how do you become a software company that doesn't care about making that dollar meet every line of code? You're trying to deliver value to your customer. You look at an application like WhatsApp, right? Everyone in here has WhatsApp installed on their phone, I can almost guarantee it. They have like, what, 23 developers, and they've been at it for two years, and they've made how much money? And they have how many users per day? It's the value that you deliver to your customer at the end of the day. That's how you need to measure yourself. That's what they keep saying up here. How do you get uh, your company to measure value in that way? Yep, thank you. Go we'll fast there. I think it's there. Okay, one question other than velocity. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, we are talking about the agile, but that transformation from waterfall to agile. Okay, so we are facing a uh, lot of, uh, you can say in the team, uh, a resistance from the team, initial resistance. And uh, that might affect the productivity or, uh, I mean, the team is, you know, initially it's very, I mean, that there is no role specific in the agile. I mean, there is no QA or a developer. So that resistance is something we are observing initial resistance. So what are the ways or how should uh, initially we tackle that? Linda, that, that belongs into you. I, I, I can't resist it. I can't resist it. Just fire and start over here. It's always the easiest way to go. Resistance to learning. That's Linda's department. Fire them and get them. I, I have a story about Kent Beck. Anybody know Kent Beck? And I was, there was a session where uh, early on we were talking about XP, and somebody said, hey, I've got a programmer on my team who won't pair program. What should we do with him? And Kent said, fire him. So I think that's a little severe. <laughs> I think you should be not asking the question, 
is this guy worth keeping around because he pair programs or not? That's really irrelevant. We should be talking about value. We keep coming back to that. Is he adding value? And, and my story is of working with the 777 airplane where I was trying to teach people the ADA programming language and many of them were resistant. That was the innovation at the time for that airplane. And if we had fired all the people who were resistant to using that programming language, then that airplane would never have gotten off the ground. Because those individuals, those resistors, those laggards, were the ones that had all the domain expertise. If you had just kept the exciting innovators, early adopters, who said, oh, wow, we get to try this new programming language, there wouldn't have been a 777. And that's the question you should always ask about anybody. Not just because Agile is the latest buzzword, and we want to move to some set of teams that have a certain set of practices, that doesn't have anything to do with anything. You're running a business or you're in a business and you're in a business to produce a product that has value for a customer. If that person is enabling you to do that, then you keep them around. If they're not, it doesn't have anything to do with pair programming. I would just add um, the uh the normal human tendency when faced with change is to associate it with loss. So someone's coming in saying, hey, we're going to switch from waterfall to agile. And people think, gosh, what am I going to lose? And they're afraid of that. They're afraid of that loss. So really, I find the job is to point out to them and help them understand what are they going to gain, if, if anything. And that means studying what they have today and then talking about what could be tomorrow. One of the things we talk about a lot is stress. There's a lot of stress in software development. Some people might think it's going to be less stressful to do a whole bunch of analysis, you know, taking your time with that analysis and then that design. And, but you could find ways to point out that that has its problems too. Stress to the company when they deliver the wrong product. Um, so if you can help people learn how the change is going to benefit them, right? We find when we help companies adopt test-driven development and refactoring and things like that, the quality goes up, the defects go down dramatically, life is less stressful at work, it's better, it's a better world. Why would they resist that, right? Why not come to work and be enjoying yourself? So I think part of it is education around, you know, how it could be better. Coming back to pair programming and that comment from Ken Fat, I've seen companies where they say, it's okay, don't pair. And the rest of the team pairs. And what they do say is, there's one thing we're going to do, though. You don't have to pair, but we're going to track defects with the code written. And I know in one case, there was a fellow who uh, started to get pretty embarrassed because they looked at the defects, and most of them are coming from him. And the rest of the team was pairing. So eventually, you know what happened? He would walk up to people and say, want to pair? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the only thing you can get on that. So um, there are the more uh, generous and gentle ways to approach that. Let me add some serious comments. Uh, I think like velocity and acceleration getting bogged down in story points, uh, or like the conversation we were having earlier about having a team, but compensation is a different topic. In, your, in, a, in this context, let's not get hung up on the fact that in Agile we're talking about teams and a product owner and everybody is equal, it has nothing to do with their titles and the hierarchy you have in the company. Don't mix the two. Which is the big problem you have when you begin to start having conversations with everybody is equal, it's all the team, it's all the cumulative effort, there's no longer a lead, and the lead goes, what, I got demoted? So it's a, so don't mix how you're structuring for a management structure for pe overall people management. Don't confuse it with how you're delivering product. Uh, and I think that's the key. I can't imagine that it's difficult. I can't imagine that anybody works in this industry anymore today and says, I don't want to be agile, I want to stay waterfall. Which idiot would do that? Uh, it's a fact of life. The issue is not coming from that. Uh, the issue is going to come from, I was the lead, I was running these guys, now I'm not running these guys. What does that mean? Did you take away my lead title? 
So you gotta you gotta manage that bit of it and make sure that that element of uh, what I got demoted, did I have a lesser role now, uh, is taken away. So don't mix that with how you organize the team and choose to build product. I think diversity is very important. One of the things I remember, I used to be what I call phonetic, right? So I would go into companies and say, okay, these guys don't want to prayer. These guys don't want to come and sit at the dining tables with the rest of them. They think they are like some uber big shots. Let's just fire them, right? And that was me maybe 10 years ago. And uh, when I was in the US working for a company, uh, I had people who were much working many more years than how old I was, right? So I said, well, these guys, it's just going to be extremely hard to change them. So it's just better to get rid of them and get a bunch of uh, young guys who are more adaptable, more willing to change and will embrace everything I have to say. Uh, but then obviously you can't get rid of these guys because each of these guys hold 50, 60 patents. You go into their room, there's a wall filled of patents and they look at a bug report or they look at something and they'll tell you exactly which line where needs to be fixed, right? In, in vendor products and stuff like that. They've spent so many years, they have such deep expertise. But they think it's a waste of time pairing with someone else because that will slow them down. It will get in their way and they've been used to certain ways of doing things. So what we let them is just be, let them be themselves so that they can do what, what they're good at doing. And then gradually find opportunities where you can spend a few minutes pairing with them or talking to them and then gradually pull them. When I left two years later, everyone was on the tables. But, you know, I, obviously the immediate first few three months was like no one wants to even sit there. It was just me sitting on the table, nobody else, right? So you have to give people time. I think they will see the value, uh, but not have a knee-jerk reaction and say, well, let's just get rid of them. Sure. One last question. I think she's been waiting for a long time. So can we get a mic there? Uh, if not, you can just speak in this. Uh, I'm sorry to ask this question on a Friday late night, late evening, <laughs> because I think this may be a tough question. Uh, how do you bring Agile when you have to uh, give algorithms? Like w what I understand if you have to deliver a software, we can do a smaller piece first with not much fancy things in. So we just give a smaller piece first to the client then start adding fancy things in it. But if you have to deliver algorithms, say pricing solutions, uh, for I would like to take a small example. Suppose uh, you are an insurance company. I mean your client is an insurance company and you are giving a, a very fundu algorithm uh, to them uh, which would uh, basically give them uh, what uh, what, at what rate or what premium you should take from the client so that you don't go for a loss but at the same time if someone, some mishap happens with someone you are able to pay back the money. So say today you, you come up with an algorithm, you decide uh, that your insurance premium will be 10,000 rupees per month or whatever. Can we paraphrase the question? Uh, yeah. Can I play it back to you? You're asking? How do I, where you have reasonable features, I can pick up the features, but where it's a, a you know, fairly interconnected, indivisible whole, like a complex algorithm, key code pieces of architecture that are heavily interacting, how do you really lay them out and how do you really partition the stories? <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> good job. Go we, 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 I've, worked with, I've worked with lots of companies that do algorithms, that make algorithms. Um, and what we do is we get them to understand that they can work, they can first create the generic, the easier version of the algorithm. Because there's always going to be the, the uh, you know, corner cases. There's always going to be all the complexity that you have. There's always the easy insurance solution, right? What's the easy case? This is a simple case. There's nothing complicated. You build that first. Then you, right, but you not, may not ship that. But in the first week of development, you, you've got it up and running with tests. Now you say, what's the next most important thing we're going to add, right? Uh, and, and you add that in. So you, you can start this way. I had one company, they literally said to me, Josh, 
the algorithm guys in the company, they love to sort of work on these fancy, complex algorithms that can handle any situation. And they'll spend weeks and weeks and weeks building them when in fact, we don't even need all that fanciness. We need to actually just solve a couple of problems first, but they enjoy this because it's a challenge. And so we had to work with them to get them to pull back and just focus on the simple thing first and then add, add to it over time. So it, it really is the same thing as software development, you know, features. Start really simple, solve that, and then add sophistication incrementally. That's how I see it, right? I mean, it, it, only, it usually boils down to the same concept. I, I, I want to mention one quick thing that I forgot to say. We're talking about productivity a lot in this discussion. The biggest productivity gains I've ever had have come through practice you won't read about in Scrum. Um, I started calling it bargain hunting many years ago. Given a story on the backlog, a lot of people do this. They estimate it, and they build it. That's it. What we do is we take the story and we say, huh, what are the variety of ways that we could potentially build this? Hey, what if we gave you 80% of what you want? Because we could do that in two days instead of two weeks. And we look at the quality of our bargain hunting by the number of ideas rejected. How many ideas did we consider, how many implementations did we consider and reject before choosing one, right? That can lead to enormous productivity gains by maximizing the work not done, figuring out what not to do, figuring out what could be sufficient as an early version that we could then extend later and do all that fancy hard stuff. That adds enormous productivity gains. And it's something you ought to be doing, bargaining hard. Back to the algo question, I can't imagine any algo person telling me that they will build the whole algorithm one shot. Algorithm design by nature is iterative and incremental. I don't know any single hardcore algo guy who will say, I build the whole thing one shot. I mean, they always do it in iteration. They have test data, they run it against it, and they say, whoa, edge condition. Okay, now I'm gonna improve the algo. So algo design, I think by nature, is iterative and incremental, which fits very well with Agile. But you're not going to go ship it out, but at least you can build it that way. All right, that killed the panel. <laughs> That's the last question. Thank you guys for staying late, and thanks to the panel for being such a wonderful sport on a Friday night. <laughs>